Terrible too. welcome back to my channel. Today we're here to review Kishot by Salman Rushdie. This is a story within a story and there are multiple dimensions of reality being presented in this novel. And ultimately I think the author invites us to explore the question of alternate facts, alternate views of reality and how much control the creator has over a story once he has created it. In this novel, he presents a, ma a main character who is a older man of Indian descent. He's been living in the United States for some time. He's had a pretty prolific writing career in that some of his spy novels have been adapted for movie adaptations. The time we meet him, this Indian writer who goes by the name of Sam Duchamp because he has created a pseudonym to conceal his Indian identity so that his work will be judged on its own merit as opposed to maybe some kind of preconceived misconception about what to expect from an Indian writer. The man who calls himself Sam Duchamp, then this fictional character, he's at the point where he is regretting some of the decisions that he's made in his personal life. So even though his writing career has been more or less successful, he's at the place now where he wants to fix some of the personal parts of his life. And because he's a writer, he's going to do that through his writing. So he starts a new novel where he creates another fictional character. This fictional character is a man who embodies a lot of his own characteristics and has a lot of the same personal tragedies that the man who calls himself Sam Duchamp has. So his created character is Ismail Smile an Indian man who's had some health challenges. He's had a stroke and this stroke has left him partially disabled to the point where he's lost his job. But because he was working for his cousin, his cousin leaves him with a pretty generous financial settlement, which allows him to focus on the other parts of his life. The secondary fictional character named Ismail Smile is someone who consumes a lot of media and he's become enamored with a TV personality, a young woman who started her career as a Bollywood star but has been successful and crossed over into the American market. And now she is a very successful talk show presenter in the United States. So this secondary fictional character takes on an alias and goes by the name of Key Shot and starts to make contact with this TV personality and eventually decides to go the physical distance it will take to meet her. Along the way, he also creates another character because from the figment of his imagination, he's able to conjure up a representation of the son he imagines he will have with this TV personality. And this young man, his son, is Sancho. Now we have the real life author Salman Rushdie who has created a fictional novelist called Sam Duchamp, who has created a fictional character called Ismail Smile, who has taken on his own name, Kishot, but has also created his own progeny, his son, Sancho. And all these layers of fact becoming fiction and fiction taking on a life of its own becomes the theme that Salman Rushdie explores in this novel. And through this multiplicity of identities, both factual and fake, Rushdie makes this book into a political statement where he comments on the idea of alternative facts and the idea of the artist creating a portrait where art is supposed to imitate life. But in general, he also uses this novel and this unique storyline to show how life starts to imitate the art, which was supposed to represent the life. Well, let's go back to the title for a moment. Key Shot, of course, is Salman Rushdie's acknowledgement of the inspiration for this novel, which came from the novel by Miguel de Cervantes, which is Don Quixote, or pronounced key shot in French, Don Quixote, I suppose. And that novel, of course, encapsulates the hero's quest and the very comical idea of this anti-hero going on this quest and how Cervantes' bumbling character interacts with the world because of his failure to really connect with reality. Key shot 
also has a different meaning. He shot in English, spelled as it is pronounced, K-E-Y-S-H-O-T, comes from the narcotic drug industry, where a key shot is the amount of drug that a person can scoop up on a key in order to snort and achieve some kind of narcotic high. Key shot then, pronounced phonetically, seems to represent the drug-induced haze that a narcotic drug user or someone who's addicted to opioids might experience even though they are physically in the reality space, but they have taken themselves to a different dimension. So this novel then explores the pharmaceutical drug industry and the legitimate benefits that are derived for people with medicinal needs, but it also explores how these pharmaceutical drugs can be co-opted for their opioid content and almost invites the reader to make a decision on whether the drawbacks of one are worth sacrificing the benefits that these pharmaceuticals offer to the other. So drug use then becomes one of the major themes in this book and Rushdie's characters, all three dimensions of their manifestations, deal with having to make a decision about drug use in some way whether it impacts them or whether it impacts the people that are in their lives and whether they support the decisions to use these drugs, whether for their pharmaceutical or their narcotic benefits. So one of the other things that is explored in a big way in this book is the race and the Indian diaspora, these brown people, and the distinction between Indians from India and Indian immigrants who are living in other places versus people who are Native Americans and are referred to erroneously, I suppose, as Indians. However, we focus on the Indian immigrant living in the United States and living in the United Kingdom and some of the maybe discrimination, maybe stereotypes that they face. And so within this novel, we have three dimensions of creations, as I have mentioned before where all of them are people who are probably hesitant to give their Indian names because of concern with how they will be prejudged. And so they all use some form of pseudonym or alias. And of course, while that is a compelling theme on its own, Rushdie, in his masterful writing, takes that to another level and shows how one can create fact from fiction. So while these characters take on aliases, the aliases and the pseudonyms and the names that they go by start to represent more of their character than the names that they started off with. In this way, he shows how fact can be created out of fantasy and how while the artist may start off with the figment of his imagination and may be really skilled at making this creation come alive almost, that when this thing becomes alive, the artist, the creator, almost has no control over his creation. And sometimes this is with explosive detriment to a point where the author or the creator can no longer control the reality. And this is manifested in multiple ways, but I'll give you one example. So the third dimension creation, the man who calls himself Kishat, conceives of this idea of a son called Sancho. And Sancho represents his father, but he's almost like the Pinocchio puppet that Geppetto had created. And when Pinocchio becomes a real boy, he no longer observes the rules that Geppetto would have created for him. He takes on a life of his own, almost, and does things. He seems to bear some imprint of his creator. He seems to bear some imprint of his father. But ultimately, he goes off on his own tangent and makes his own choices to the point where Geppetto could no longer control Pinocchio, Keyshot can no longer control Sancho, and the creator in general no longer has control over what his creation does. Almost sounds biblical, almost sounds godlike, doesn't it? But Rushdie does bring it back and connects it with the idea of these alternative facts that are prevalent in our society today and shows how even 
statements that are conceived in the minds of a PR specialist or a journalist who's supposed to be reporting on the facts, but enhances something fictionally and loses control over the story as soon as it becomes reported and the world co-ops it and takes it for its own. So while alternative facts may seem like they were alternative when they were created, they take on a life of their own and become even bigger than the creator himself. So by mixing this media commentary with the hyper reality that is achieved in a psychedelic drug induced state, the author adds this deeper layer of meaning to his novel that is both necessary and challenging to contemplate, but what it ultimately achieves will leave the reader feeling a little wanting, just because it almost seems to fade to black in the end. We have these main characters who are all ripples of each other, who are all overlapping meaning and overlapping states. But given all that Salman Rushdie offers us in this book, which includes but isn't limited to the hero's quest and the fairy tale romance and the part stage production where the author and the audience interact to produce this reality, the novel, which is part satire, part parody, part three-dimensional experience of reality, given all that he offers us in this book, Ultimately, the novel becomes a little bit anticlimactic because it refuses to focus. And perhaps the swirls that Rushdie creates in this world that he offers, or these multi-worlds that he has created in this novel, maybe they can't be expected to eventually reconvene at some point. But the black hole that he envisions and writes about does not consume everything. And the fog that should force the exit into another world that would be the resolution for this book ultimately doesn't satisfy the reader. It, it doesn't resolve all the conflicts that he has aroused in this book. And so ultimately, while this book includes so much, it is a challenging but still unsatisfying read just because he takes us so far and almost leaves us hanging. So while Keyshot was a very stimulating read for me, after 390 pages, I expected to feel more after wrapping up this book which I didn't. And that is why I'm calling this book a little anticlimactic because while the author was very clever in his prose and very clever in his conception, I felt like it left me wanting at the end. And if you've read it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your commentary, whether you agree with some of what I mentioned or if you have a further exposition into maybe something that I missed. If there was something about the resolution of this novel that maybe went over my head, which is why I didn't enjoy the end as much as I had wanted to. I'd love to talk with you in the comments about it if something I said in this review makes you want to pick up this book. As you might already know, this is one of the six shortlisted books for this year's Booker Prize win. I haven't read any of the other contenders, so I don't know how this matches up with them, whether this makes a more or less bold political statement than any of the other novels. So ultimately, I am looking forward to hearing from other people as to how this compares with the other shortlisted books. So if you've read the other books and maybe you've read this one or maybe you want to compare what you know from the other novels with what I talked about in this review, I'd love to talk with you in the comments as well. So just let's talk in the comments. And until next time, happy reading. Bye.